Welcome from 3D Organon, the leading medical anatomy platform that shows the future in healthcare and medical education. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen over here. Um, so my name is Mariana Sviridi. I am the sales manager of 3D Organ in USA, Brazil, and Portugal. I'm a K uh, KCL M Farm uh, pharmacist and a dancer and dance teacher, and I will be your host for today's session. Today's webinar is about XR opportunities in pain medicine, lessons learned in training and patient care. Our distinguished uh, speaker, guest speaker for this session is Dr. Rohan Zutwani. Uh, MD, MBA, and an expert in pain medicine and pain management from Well Cornell Medicine. Um, Dr. Rohan is also our, uh, he's also a member of the American Board of Anesthesiology, pain medicine, in pain medicine. And from a clinical point of view, he's an assistant attending anesthesiologist at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and an instructor in anesthesiology at the Well Cornell Medical College. So I'm just gonna um, uh, let Dr. Rohan uh, put his presentation up. So we are proud, I want to say here, that Dr. Rohan is also a member of our 3D Organon Scientific Board. Uh, before we continue, it's important to state here that none of our guest speakers and members of the 3D Organon Scientific Board receive any financial reward or endorsement from 3D Organon. We at uh, 3D Organon support physicians fulfill the mission they are assigned for to help people uh, on their healthcare journeys with compassion, with creativity, and with care. The purpose of this webinar is to explore the opportunities and challenges associated with using extended reality technologies in pain medicine. So in current medical practice, we say, we have the saying, I really like it, that the only constant is change. Uh, yeah, I think you can um, yeah, ascertain that. Therefore, you, our audience for today, can expect to gain a deeper understanding of the potential applications of all the XR ecosystem in healthcare, including pain management. Dr. Rohan uh, will share some lessons learned from his really broad experience in training healthcare professionals in the use of XR uh, technologies. He will as well provide some real world examples of how XR solutions have been used to improve patient outcomes. Uh, by the end of this webinar, we believe you will all have a better appreciation, a better understanding for the potential of using XR in pain medicine, as well as some really practical insights and implement all these solutions offered to your current daily practice. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Rohan. The microphone is yours. Well, thank you so much, Mariana. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to have had the opportunity to work with you guys. Um, you know, I think our presentation today really does focus on practical ways uh, for people who are in the world of pain medicine or just in the world of medicine in general to start thinking about how they can incorporate XR um, into their worlds. So if you just bear with me for one second. Exactly, just... yes. Just start a broadcast. And we are going to share my presentation. Now, Mariana, can you can you see my slides? Yes, I can see perfect your first slide. Very good. Very good. So Thank you again for that wonderful introduction. Our uh, presentation today is about extended reality opportunities in pain medicine. Um, it's gonna be a very practical approach uh, to give people kind of all the nitty gritty of how we're doing what it is we're doing at Wild Cornell Medicine um, and how companies like 3D Organon are playing a big role in that. Um, as we all stated, uh, I am a scientific advisor to 3D Organon, but I don't receive any financial remuneration for my services. Uh, I do also have an ongoing grant with another company called Body Swaps, um, as well as from Meta, and uh, I have no other conflict of interests to disclose. So today's presentation is going to be in three acts. 
Um, act one is I'm going to talk a little bit about pain medicine and, and specifically interventional pain medicine, uh, which is the art of, you know, sort of both teaching and deploying very specific procedures aligned on exploring human anatomy and treating pain. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how extended reality can um, train physicians in pain medicine and go through some of the use cases that we've been using it for. Um, and then I'm going to finish by talking about just some of the current problems that we see when using extended reality and the future directions we're thinking about taking this. So start off with one, how do we approach pain? Um, so if you look at a screen like this, right, when people think of pain medicine, they mostly think of the thing they see on the screen, which is pills. Um, and as somebody who has done a fair bit of training in pain medicine, um, I can say that the way that pain doctors think about, you know, treating pain is, is very different. We see the world of pain medicine as a multimodal approach. Um, and just to be a little bit more specific for our audience members that may not know a lot about our field of medicine, um, pain medicine comes in two flavors. There's acute pain medicine when we think about pain, uh, treating pain that involves an acute type of injury, um, most common one probably being surgery. And there's a second type of pain medicine called chronic pain medicine. Uh, and chronic pain medicine in its most technical definition is pain that's been around for about three months or more. But the way that pain doctors kind of see chronic pain is when the injury itself is no longer the driving mechanism or may not be the driving mechanism anymore. And pain becomes a part of the disease itself. So what we're helping to treat is the signal of pain that is ongoing, even if the injury itself isn't actively present. So those are sort of two sides of the same coin, acute and chronic pain. And both acute and chronic pain doctors, which, you know, luckily I have the chance to play both roles in my current job at Wild Cornell, um, all of us are thinking about pain from this kind of viewpoint of what we call multimodal management. Um, and so when I say the word multimodal, it's this notion that there is no one silver bullet that treats pain medicine. Um, or that treats pain, both either in the acute or the chronic setting. And my next slide is just to give you guys a sense of why pain medicine is so important in our society. So, you know, a slide like this is something very common that you'll see in the news, but it has to go back to the fact that, you know, for years now we've been dealing with an opioid epidemic in our society. And a part of that opioid epidemic stems from the use of you know, opioid medicines to treat pain. Um, a lot of people will say that they had their start with, you know, kind of an opioid addiction in the setting of getting pain medicine after surgery. And, uh, you know, it really has prompted some, some deeper investigation on our part as pain doctors as to how we can change this and, and change the tide of the opioid epidemic in America. Um, and one way that we're doing that is by trying to make pain medicine more multimodal, which is to say our over-reliance on a single form of medication like opioids may be a contributing factor to this. Um, and so when we talk about multimodal, we're talking about things like medications, but we're also talking about things like physical therapy, psychology, and you know something that I'm fairly passionate about, which is interventional pain medicine which is procedures that are designed to help treat uh, you know, patients who live in pain, both in the acute setting and in the chronic setting. Another very interesting thing to note is that the New York Times just published actually, I believe today or yesterday, that um, one in five Americans now lives with pain. Um, and pain in general has become more common than most of the chronic diseases that we're familiar with, like diabetes. Um, and so it's probably one of the most common reasons that Americans are visiting their doctors. And it deeply affects the quality of life of, like we said, one in five Americans. Um, so solutions 
designed around pain medicine have huge impacts for our society, both here in the United States and globally. So I wanted to start off by just giving you an example of what it is we do in pain medicine, or one of the elements of what it is we do in pain medicine. And in this slide, what you're seeing is what we call a nerve block. Um, so you can see that there is a interventionalist um, who has an ultrasound probe on a patient with one hand and a needle in the other hand. And going back to this concept of multimodal analgesia and multimodal pain management, um, you know, patients will come in for surgery uh, for a very discrete part of their body, let's say their arm. And with the ability to be able to do things like interventional pain medicine, we can take very small amounts of medication around very specific parts of the human body and provide analgesia such that the reliance on other forms of pain medicine, like opioids, may be less. Um, and in fact, sometimes we even do this in an operating room as what we call a primary anesthetic, which is you may be able to have a patient who's lightly napping during a surgery while they're doing a major procedure on their arm because you've numbed up the nerves in such a specific way. Um, and so many people have described things like pain medicine and regional anesthesia as the embodiment of anatomy, the, a very clinical uh, use of anatomical knowledge. Um, and it's taken decades and decades and decades of many folks uh, you know, across the world to be able to develop this kind of science where we can safely do this. This is an example of us doing that very same block. And, and you can see on the corner, um, there is one of my colleagues, Dr. John Rubin, who works very closely with me with a lot of our XR projects. So this is a picture, usually we give this presentation together, but I believe today he's fairly busy working in the operating rooms. Um, and so here's a picture that he took teaching this nerve block in India. And when he describes the story, he often goes into you know, the notion that places like in India um, may not have access to a lot of the same tools that we do here in the United States. But in order to safely do these procedures, um, you know, we're, it, it, we feel that it's our moral obligation to help teach some of these safer methods. So, you know, faculty like John will go um, you know, a couple of weeks of year, they'll take time off uh, and at great expense, go to India and try and teach some of these methods um, so that they, they can more safely do their, uh, you know, some of these procedures and we can actually learn some of the interesting things they might be doing, uh, you know, with ultrasound based needle guided technology um, and that we can all globally as, as a group figure out new creative ways to perform this multimodal um, pain management. Um, and one of the interesting things that he often talks about is how much they learn in the presence of each other being able to do these procedures together, but how rare it is for them to actually be able to do this. And on a global level, how difficult it is for us to be able to teach something like nerve blocks, you know, for a particular surgery without the extreme amount of work that goes into planning these kinds of trips. We also, I always like to talk about just the nature of, of um, how complex these procedures can get. So this is a picture of what's actually on the screen when we do blocks like this. And uh, you know the white lines kind of represent the needle trajectory. And we do this in a way where we're constantly watching our needle as it sort of traverses the various layers of the human body. But the other thing I want you to take a note of is, you know, you'll see that kind of honeycomb structure labeled BP that stands for brachial plexus. So those are the nerves. Uh, we're trying to not have the needle enter into the nerves, but around the nerves so that we, we don't have any nerve damage. So that's why we like to always see where our needles are. But also if you take a look, you know, you see things like the first rib and you see things like the pleura, which give you a sense that the brachial plexus is probably millimeters away from lung. Um, and so there's also a structure called the SA, that's the artery. So what we're trying to sort of convey on this slide is that, you know, while these methods have been pretty revolutionary in our ability to, you know, deploy safe analgesia and safe anesthesia, they're also fairly dangerous and technically challenging to treat because the difference between a successful nerve block 
and um, a very poor patient outcome is literally millimeters sometimes. And so, you know, faculty spend a lot of time thinking about how do we teach these procedures well so that our trainees uh, can safely perform this under our guidance. And so in order to teach people to do these kind of nerve blocks, uh, we rely on our medical system and its training. Um, and for the, you know, for most of human history, our way of treating people, or sorry, training people within the world of medicine has really been an apprenticeship model. Um, and in its most current form, that takes, you know, the form of residency and sometimes a fellowship. And there are lots of pros and cons about the system. Uh, so a major pro is that, you know, we've been successfully training residents and fellows to do these kinds of procedures for decades now. Um, and, you know, the product tends to work because we train residents who their first day of practice uh, will be able to perform these procedures fairly safely. But there are cons. Um, one of the major cons of the apprenticeship model um, is that if your apprentice, if, if your teacher doesn't know how to do these procedures, it's very hard for you as a trainee to learn it in that system. And that's why people go across the country to get special kinds of training. Um, you know, we have colleagues who come all the way from really reputed major medical centers to train here uh, in New York City with us uh, to learn some of these procedures. Because even at the world's biggest, you know, medical centers, again, if they don't have the right service to do it if there's not the right, um, you know, elements involved in, in creating the kind of system needed to take care of these patients. These procedures just don't get done. And that means a generation of trainees won't learn it. And if they don't learn it during residency or fellowship, it's very unlikely they're going to decide to pick this up while they're already in practice. So there are major flaws to the apprenticeship model. Um, so here at, at the place where I currently work while Cornell Medicine, we, within the world of our residency and within the world of our interventional pain fellowship, have this kind of um, three institutional approach between while Cornell, Hospital for Special Surgery, and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I would say that we are a bit of an anomaly in how much training we give to our residents because they get to go to these three world-class institutions and each of these institutions do things a little differently, um, but our residents get to see three different styles, which means, you know, we may they may do nerve blocks at Sloan that we don't do here at Cornell um, and vice versa. Uh, so our trainees get the benefit of not only a huge volume of procedures, but of the different experiences of the people who do those procedures as well, different methodologies. And so we're fairly lucky, I would say. Um, to give you a sense of exactly what we're teaching, right? Because I've talked about basically one kind of pain procedure or nerve block right now. Um, remember- Sorry, you know, Dr. Owen, one small intervention. Um, I yeah. think you, as we see your uh, screen, uh, my window is in the, uh, on the left side of your slides. So maybe try oh. to move me a bit so that, yeah, people can see better, yeah. Very good. Thank you. So um, interventional pain medicine. Right, we talked about it. It comes in two flavors, chronic and acute. Um, so these are the procedures that that sort of make up interventional pain medicine, and it's an intentionally busy slide. I don't expect you to see all of this and and sort of expect to really give you a grasp. But one thing I do want to kind of point out is if you look back probably 15 years ago, half these procedures didn't exist, um, and so every year we keep adding more and more procedures but we don't really change the length of training. Now you can make the argument that people can do fellowships in these areas to spend an extra year. Um, but even then, you know, we, we have really a ton of difficulty making sure that every trainee is trained in every one of these procedures by the time they graduate. Um, and I wanna show you some numbers about this. So this is a study that was published, uh, you know, within the last decade, from a very, very major medical center. Um, you know, I won't say exactly what that medical center is, but you know, it's well regarded as one of the top medical centers in the country. And they looked at their resident experiences 
and they start to publish some of their numbers. And these are the pain procedures that we had on the other slide. So as you can see, there's a fair bit of pain procedures, which if you look at the median of the resident experience, um, some of them are zero. So, you know, even at some of the major medical centers, it's tough to get people a really robust kind of training. Um, and so, you know, it, it behooves us to think about like, you know, residents go out into the world and, and sometimes they've just never done something. And it may be something that becomes a part of their practice. There's also this issue of scalability. Okay, so we've talked before about, you know, the, the costs associated with training people um, and the resource burden. Uh, you know, you need a lot of experts, you need a lot of time to do this. Um, like I said, few institutions have really great expertise in this area. And then, you know, for example, I'm out of training pretty recently, but there will be new things that are developed that I've never learned before because they just didn't happen during the time of my training. Right now, you know, the kind of model that we have is that in order to learn these kinds of things, people must go for very expensive and far away seminars where they'll practice on, you know, whatever, you know, the models are that they have at those seminars. And, you know, one of my, one of my um, colleagues and, and partners, uh, Dr. Pak published a study a few years ago uh, where he basically uh, did surveys on graduating fellows uh, you know, for a specific type of therapy that we do called spinal cord stimulation. And in publishing some of his work, he basically found that close to half uh, the um, fellows, literally half uh, in the country, thought that there were unmet needs for training. Um, so what I really want to sort of, you, uh, the audience to sort of take away from this is, you know, we really need to be training a lot more doctors on how to do these interventional procedures. It's of major societal value that we do this. Um, but our current models, I would argue, are not great. Um, and there's huge gaps in the needs for these kind of training people in these interventional procedures. The last slide is this is a um, this is a picture of our multi-million dollar sales simulation center here at Cornell. We're, we're very excited about it. Um, and a lot of time and energy has been thought into simulation training, right? Being able to safely train people to do, you know, not just these procedures, but all kinds of, you know, various things in medicine uh, in a safe environment with feedback. Um, I will also be fairly honest with you. Um, our residents don't see this simulation center often enough. Uh, because it is very, very expensive, not just to open up these simulation centers and maintain them, but one of the biggest things that we struggle with is the time, getting the right people into the right room. You know, residents are mostly workers as much as they are learners. And, you know, for many departments, the struggle is how do we get a huge number of our residents out into a sim center once a week? The cost of that alone can be astronomical because if you think about it if those residents are in the sim center they're not in the hospital and so you have to hire other people to do those tasks while they're in the sim center so people have quoted thousands and thousands of dollars of cost when it comes to kind of finding a few hours you know a week to get the residents out for their simulations uh, and so you know, our, our residents, as much as we can try and get them out, probably won't see this more than a few times a year. Which brings me to act two. And, and this is where extended reality kind of comes into play. So um, personally, my great kind of inspiration for wanting to even work in extended reality actually stems from a scene just like this. Um, so if you thought that this wasn't going to reference the matrix, um, you know, a presentation about extended reality and training, uh, you might have gotten the wrong picture because really, I mean, what we all want as faculty members who train residents um, and as people are interested in learners is this scene, right? Where somebody comes to us and says, you know, I think I know how to do something or I'd like to learn how to do something. And we just say, show me, right? And we go into a space where there are very little to no consequences. And our trainees show us exactly what they can and can't do. And if there are gaps, we fix them right there and then at the moment that we need to fix them. 
So this is a picture of our colleagues kind of doing extended reality uh, when it comes to some kind of orthopedic knee surgery. And I would make the argument that, you know, folks in the surgical space have been thinking about, you know, kind of training in extended reality for a lot longer than folks in the world of pain medicine or anesthesiology have been. Um, but one of the really exciting things is we've learned a ton from our colleagues who have been developing these kind of protocols on how to train people in procedural medicine. The only difference I'd argue in our space versus maybe in the orthopedic space is that um, we simply struggled with getting the software, right? Um, you know, for us, it's a very different kind of software. We're not looking to build things like drills or specific types of, you know, tools in extended reality. What we really wanted and what we really needed in the world of pain medicine and anesthesiology was the ability to uh, simulate the specificity and the granularity of the kind of anatomy that we were looking at with every procedure. Um, and that's actually where I first discovered 3D Organon. Um, so when I was in fellowship, um, you know, and I was trying to learn a lot of these procedures myself. Uh, sometimes it was very conceptually difficult. Uh, part of what makes, you know, pain medicine, you know, safe and, and interesting and exciting for many of us is, is we use image guidance, whether it's an ultrasound or an x-ray machine. But, you know, what I had noticed was that in trying to evolve from being a trainee to being, you know, a full-fledged expert in, in this area, um, was that the experts are able to do something which the trainees kind of struggle with. The experts are able to take the image that they're seeing on the screen, which is a 2D image, and translate that into a 3D image in their, in their minds. And they're able to then traverse whatever instrument they're using, whether it's a needle or a cannula or a probe, and really translate, you know, across 2D images but in a very 3D way. Um, and so I had first gotten, you know, a MetaQuest 2 and, and 3D Organon just to try and do this. And I began to notice that I was able to make those conceptual leaps faster. Um, and it got me interested in doing this for a very specific thing, creating a sort of what I like to call a tiny simulation or point of care simulation for um, my other trainees and, and sometimes the med students or residents would be working with us. Um, and so we did, we basically, there is a very specific procedure that we do in chronic pain medicine called a lumbar radiofrequency ablation, where we're trying to basically um, target very tiny nerves around the bones of the spine. And what makes this procedure challenging is that the radio frequency cannula creates a burn along a very specific path. So it's not just about hitting the target itself, it's about creating the right angle for that you know, radio frequency ablation along that pathway. And that's what many of our uh, trainees struggle with, which is learning the path to the nerve itself as long as just where the nerve is. And so in a very simple way, what I started to do was bring my headset to work and I would use the casting on my cell phone. I'd put the headset on myself. I would simulate um, basically the lower spine and I would display just using the controllers, the trajectories of the cannulas themselves. I would say, okay, this is why we turn this way and this is why we, our needles come in, you know, at point A and rest at point B. And this is how we do this procedure successfully. I'd show them while they were looking at 2D on my cell phone, and I was doing kind of the simulation in 3D, um, and then we'd switch. Then I would put the headset on the learner and I would say, now you show me how you're going to do the procedure. And they would, they would be able to enter into that space on the same, you know, kind of model that I had used, and they simulate kind of the same trajectories that I just showed them on my phone. This is, we're talking about real creativity and a real, like, uh, amazing way to combine all these methods and all these, uh, the application of XR. This is like something, when I hear about it, it's, it's amazing, the way you put it into practice, actually. Well, what was amazing to me was how simple it was. 
Yeah. Like it literally what could have taken like a one hour lecture about radio frequency ablations and cannula placements. It took like three to five minutes. And the best part was I would only do it on the days where like the learner was going to do that procedure. In fact, we could do it 10 minutes before the procedure started. So it was this concept of like the right place and the right time for the right learner. Um, and so then the learner would come into the room with me as we were doing the procedure together. And it's like they had done it three or four times, even though they had never done it before. Um, and so we published this. We published this as an educational tool, our methods, how we were able to go about it, how we were kind of like teaching in this very new and interesting way. Um, and it caught people's attention. Um, and the lesson and the sort of comments that I would get from the learners who absolutely loved the experience, they were like, even if they had done a radio frequency ablation a few times, when we had done the simulation with them, I remember like they would take their headset off. They'd be like, I finally get it. I finally get for the first time exactly. what I'm supposed to be doing in this procedure. Like I'm not, one of the things that often, you know, can be difficult about being a trainee is, you know, when you're doing these kinds of procedures, your goal is to just make the picture look right, right? Like all you're trying to do is, is, is get the picture to look like what you've seen other people do or what you've seen the textbook do. But what we're trying to really get, you know, folks in interventional pain to learn how to do is think beyond the picture, right? Do what the attendings are doing and try and translate that picture into 3D. Um, and this was just a tool that we could do to do it that didn't take, you know, years and years of experience. So when I started to work at Cornell, the question I most often got was, okay, well, what can you do more than that? right? Because the radio frequency ablation is a very specific procedure. You know, we're not doing it that often. It only really affects a very small subset of our learners. Can you come up with something more complicated? Um, and so we did. Uh, and we created what was called the neuraxial masterclass. Uh, so the neuraxial means basically procedures oriented around the spine. Um, and we wanted to cover things like epidurals or spinal injections or, you know, threading, you know, um, catheters into different parts of the spine, how they were different. So my colleague, John Rubin, and I, we start to like kind of dream up, okay, um, every resident of ours will do hundreds of epidurals probably by the time they graduate. But how do we come up with a master class that really conceptualizes all the nuances that we really can't teach while there's a patient sitting in front of us and they're doing the procedure. That was really our impetus for creating this. Like, How do we take that kind of master level learning that you get from doing thousands of these and put it into a session? And uh, what was really exciting was 3D Organon had just announced its multi-user model. So now it wasn't just me and one user like switching the headset back and forth, but it could be a lot of users together, right? Um, in a space. So we created this like little curriculum um, and it involved orientation because most of our users had never used VR before. We did it with about usually around five or so people, including one teacher. Um, we would do a session where we'd select people's avatars and get them to join the multi-user space. Um, we'd start with an anatomy dissection. Uh, again, very hard to do as a resident. Uh, we don't really have many opportunities to you know, go back to the cadaver lab. Uh, so the idea that we could create virtual cadavers around us was incredible. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many people do epidurals every day, have done them hundreds of times as a resident, and still don't know what muscles they're crossing to get to that space. Um, so, you know, we would talk a little bit about the comparative anatomy. So for the first time, we could do things like take different parts of the spine, break them apart, and, you know, show them side by side you know, and talk about things like why certain areas of the spine are trickier than others, why the angles are different in other areas, uh, you know, and maybe higher up, we use more acute angles than in the lower parts of the spine. Um, we would compare needle trajectories. Um, and then in the end, we would actually do a demonstration where each of the learners had to explain to us their way of getting from point A to point B in different parts of the spine. Um, and so, you know, we're still doing the neuraxial masterclass about once or twice a month. Um, and the residents seem to really love it. Um, 
you know, it's, it's been a really game changer for us to be able to offer something that, again, you know, we're, we're trying to take this thing of how do we take years of experience and boil it down to a class where we can actually teach these concepts. Then we start to get really tricky with, you know, XR. So, um, like I said, there are even things I don't know how to do and I need to learn how to do. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of where we start to get into a little bit more of the conceptual stuff of what I like to call pre-procedural education or pre-procedural planning. Um, so I had a patient who came in who was a transgender patient who for years had been living with chronic sternal pain due to a practice called chest binding whereby the individual is trying to reduce the size of their, or like the feeling of their breasts by putting very tight corsets. It created a lot of chronic external pain. Um, had really failed a lot of other therapies. And the pain to me on exam felt a lot like the type of pain I see from patients who have had sternotomies um, for cardiac surgery. Um, and it just so happens I know an expert who does nerve blocks for chest wall pain, uh, my colleague, Dr. Rubin, except I had never done any of these nerve blocks before. So for me, it was very hard to conceptualize how I could offer a therapy to a patient that was fairly abstract to me. Um, and so here's what we did. Um, on the day of the procedure, Dr. Rubin came into our office and we wore the headsets um, and he just showed us, this is how I do the procedure. Uh, we were able to dissect, uh, you know, a thoracic model uh, down to the muscles and the layers. Um, and, you know, at this point in our training, you know, when you're fairly advanced, I don't really need to know, like, this is the feeling of getting to the layer. I just need to know this is where the needle goes. This is how to get there safely. This is how I conceptualize the angulation and, and how I get in through, you know, these are the structures to avoid. So from that perspective, watching Dr. Rubin do that procedure for us in virtual reality and then us participating with him in the multi-user setting basically taught us everything we needed to know. And then Dr. Rubin was with us when we did the procedure, but at no point did he ever need to glove in. You know, so having, you know, that experience of being able to safely do these things and being able to safely get the information that we need from experts um, that is what I'm calling, you know, this kind of new version of extended reality, which is point of care extended reality, where we can simply have the headsets and get the right training at the right time, um, because the technology has really allowed us to do that. So this is sort of a session or what our sessions kind of feel like. So this is Dr. Rubin and I, again, planning another procedure for another patient. Hello, Dr. Rubin, how are you? Hello, Dr. Rubin, how are you? Hey, Dr. Jotwani, it's great to see you. Good how can I help you today? Buddy. Um, well, we have an interesting case coming up, and I want to just talk about some pre-procedural planning. Uh, so I have a patient, sure. elderly gentleman, who came to me through um, one of our nerve reconstruction surgeons in plastic surgery. And it's an elderly gentleman who's been in horrible, intractable pain for the last seven, eight months. And hmm. uh, up until this point, it's sort of been a little bit of a mystery. We can't really find where the pain is coming from. And all of our previous interventions and medications have not really worked. Um, so the okay. ask is, can we find a novel location to place a peripheral nerve stimulator in order to help both diagnose what the pain is and as well as create kind of a treatment plan, at least for a limited span of 60, 70 days while we try and figure out what's going on? Um, sure. As you know, I'm fairly minimalist and conservative in my approach for this. So if we are going to do some kind of a stimulator, I want to target. So the patient initially presented with uh, pain around this region over here. But now the, the pain region. Yes. But now the pain seems to be sort of coming back like this and around oh, this that's area very as well. Interesting. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think that could be sort of a occipital type picture as well yeah i mean i i think that you know it's an act and you know maybe not a typical presentation but certainly occipital pain can radiate over the top and uh cause that type of pain into the right. sort of trigeminal type distribution so what complicates the matters is that 
they did find on a lot of head scans um, that there may be, if you want to come right over here. Yeah, sure. That there may be some form of occlusion or some kind of stenosis right here proximal to the Cassarian ganglion. So, you know, kind of what I'd, I'd like to get across from there is, is one, Dr. Rubin and I are not even the same room. We're in completely different locations, but we can meet in these kinds of spaces, um, record sessions. We can, you know, like I said, break models apart, put them back together. And it really just changes the dynamic of communication, right? This is not a phone call. This is not a Zoom. This is this is like kind of the version of, of us really having a more physical and, and immersive interaction with how we communicate with each other. So even though Dr. and Ruben and I might have different thoughts and opinions about how we go about a particular case, we're able to actually talk through those things in a very immersive way. And, and to me, that is an incredible opportunity to change the way that we as medical professionals who all kind of see things from our own specialties and our own angles might be able to come together to actually talk about patients and their cases. It also, like we mentioned, helps with pre-procedural planning. So this is uh, a paper that we recently published in Interventional Pain. Um, and in it, basically a patient had come to me um, and she had a spinal mass. Uh, and basically the ask was, can I do a nerve block in such a way where I can target the nerve without touching the mass? Um, and you can look from the MRI pictures that the mass, mass is fairly in there, in the spine, um, and very close to the nerves. And so for a lot of uh, folks, this may be fairly anxiety-inducing, right? How do I do this safely? Um, you know, even with image guidance, it's not like we can actually see the mass itself. And so using 3D Organon and some quick measurements that we made on the scan, we were able to create a pretty close to fidelity replication of the model. And then actually my fellow and I practiced the procedure we were hoping to do, which is a transforaminal epidural steroid injection, um, and figured out what we thought the right angles would be and the best way to approach this. Now you can make the argument, well, can't you just do that on the MRI itself? Um, and the answer to that is probably, we've been doing that for quite some time. Um, sorry, did I just lose the screen? Yeah, but I think now we are, yeah, you are back. Okay. Perfect. I thought it was Dr. Rubin from the other room, our medverse room, trying to get in. <laughs> <laughs> in our... So the needle trajectory, we developed that kind of trajectory while practicing in the virtual space. We're able to actually execute that on the table with the patient. Um, and the case went successfully really well. And, and you know, and patient got really profound relief from the injection. We were able to do it safely. And like I mentioned before, while we have been able to conceptualize these type of procedures previously by just doing this in MRI, what I think of is this is the next iteration of that, right? This is our ability to make that MRI session where we're looking through scans even more immersive and interesting for our learners and, and for us. Um, and so we've actually taken this steps even further. So one of the things that we've been working on now is actually taking the patient's real imaging um, and turning it into N of one models. So I had a patient who came to me who had previously failed uh, peripheral uh, nerve stimulation therapy. Um, and we kind of took a different approach to it by using the patient's imaging to recreate their uh, anatomy and then sort of thinking about with the patient directly where we thought the best targets would be. And then we were able to go into the operating room and do the procedure in a way that pretty much confirmed what we had planned in virtual reality. Um, and so 
we are constantly thinking about how to safely and um, efficiently execute our procedures and plan them in virtual reality using these tools that are already out there um, and readily available. So I wanna end by just talking a little bit about lessons learned in the future. Um, you know, as you can tell, um, you know, our philosophy, at least when it comes to XR, has been fairly simple. Um, you know, I'm of the notion that I want to take technology that's really well built um, and use it to execute um, as quickly as possible, right? So for us, it's not about, you know, sort of creating something in a lab that takes 10 years and then maybe one day it kind of sees the patient bedside. It's about taking these really, really strong technologies um, and keeping things as simple as possible. Because, you know, the one thing I'll say right off the front is XR requires a fair bit of patience. And Mariana and I, you and I talk about this all the time. Um, the rewards are fantastic. The exactly. experience that we give exactly. students and, and learners is unreal, but it also requires a little bit of patience. Um, and it requires being creative and using your imagination quite a bit about how to overcome obstacles. Um, and so some of the obstacles that we faced as we've done these sessions, uh, you know, we like to talk about, um, you know, kind of XR can be a fairly scary place as well, at least for our learners who have never placed the headset on before. So in XR, we can see wonderful things and, and you know, things that are very hard to replicate otherwise. But as the screen on the on the picture on the right can show you, it can also be really chaotic. Um, and so we've learned a ton of lessons. So one lesson that we've learned is that the orientation before you get into kind of 3D Organon and are doing your incredible procedures and planning, the orientation is so important. You need to get people into these spaces. Uh, you need to be able to train them on how to use the controllers, set up guardians appropriately. You know, it's, it, the technology is not worth it if people are getting injured using it, right? So we need to make sure that you know, um, safety is paramount to these experiences um, and the tools exist. It's just about taking the time to really orient people into virtual reality. And so people love to skip the first 10 minute orientation sessions. Um, and if anything, I'm now interested in how do we make those more streamlined, more, um, you know, more close to what the learner and the new user needs. Um, in terms of orienting their minds to virtual reality. Uh, another thing that we learned kind of early on, uh, avatars, while super cool and super exciting, can also be fairly chaotic. Um, and they can create a lot of distraction. Um, and so while everyone chooses an avatar, there may be sessions where we get rid of them uh, for the session, or only the learner, or only the learner demonstrating, or only the teacher teaching will have their avatar present. Um, so, you know, the lessons that we're learning is that this is an incredible technology, but it's also a technology that needs a lot of finesse. Um, and it, a lot of thought needs to go into the physical spaces where we employ virtual reality type teaching. Um, thought needs to go into, you know, the user experience as much as we possibly can make it. future directions that we're thinking about, uh, things like haptics would be really exciting, right? To actually be able to feel as we traverse various layers of the human body and what those feelings, what those, you know, what, uh, you know, a pop into, uh, you know, the perineural space may look like, what, you know, loss of resistance into the epidural space may look like. These are things that our team is thinking about a fair bit. Um, we're thinking about ultrasound-based models. So we, we want ultrasound that has very high fidelity to the kind of things that we're seeing. So that way we really can give people complete control and access over, you know, kind of learning the anatomy um, as much as they possibly like. And then patient-specific models. So one of the things I always tell people as we're doing our master classes is anyone can do an epidural in virtual reality. Right. Um, but real life is where it gets more technically challenging because 
the sort of things that you see at 3 a.m. at night, really bad scoliosis, really bad degeneration of the spine, these things are kind of where we really want you to abstract what you're seeing in terms of virtual reality and then turn that into a patient-specific model. So, you know, one of the advantages here is that there are so many technologies and, and now even now even 3D Organon has a DICOM viewer, right? So where we can really take interesting MRIs and turn them into libraries of content that weren't really possible before. And so, so those are some of the future directions that we're really excited by when it comes to this tech. And our goal, you know, as, as Dr. Rubin often tells me is um, one day our hope is that, you know, we as a medical community um, expanding countries and, and all kinds of specialty barriers will be able to come together in these kind of virtual spaces and learn from each other. And uh, who knows, maybe we won't have to send Dr. Rubin on you know, multi-week trips to India to teach these procedures. Maybe we'll develop a technology that, that allows us to not only teach these procedures, but really learn to communicate and maintain those relationships as well. Um, so that way we, we all learn together and, and kind of improve medical care. So those are our goals. And I'm here for any questions that you guys may have. Right, that was amazing. Um, thank you so much. I think it's safe to say we reached the end of this presentation, of the presentation part. Uh, Dr. Rohan, thank you for all your valuable insights. Um, and as we, you invited already our audience, let's go to our Q&A session now. Uh, I would like to invite to open the floor to all our attendees. Uh, we're going to try to address as many questions as uh, time um, permits. Um, so, Dr. Rohan, the microphone is all yours. I'm going to see what we have here. People are thanking you in our chat. And I'm going to open the floor now. Seems like our audience is mesmerized. <laughs> and, I mean, Mariana, you and I can also talk too. I mean, we, we talk all the yes. time about kind of yes. the technology and, and kind of what you guys are seeing. And and you guys have so many folks um, in your network now who are doing so many incredible things with this tech. Um, one thing that I, I don't know, I, I'm always curious about this. And I think many people who are trying to teach in, in virtual reality are, are thinking about this too, which is, this is a new form of pedagogy, right? Like this idea that we are developing, you know, um, a kind of learning that has never really existed, yeah. you know, in history until this time. Um, I, I personally would love more researchers that are working on trying to figure out what that kind of learning looks like, mm -hmm. you know, from a pedagogy standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that often hits me is, you know, obviously the experiences that people have in virtual reality are incredible. Um, but is it incredible because the technology is so interesting and unique and exciting? Or is it incredible because we're actually relaying the kind of messages that we want to relay? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's uh, the question right there. And um I think it's what you also mentioned just before about people coming together and building teams and um, pushing all this knowledge and building this fire all together. So having someone trying this out and getting with getting in touch with you or getting in touch with another team and saying, oh, hey, I managed to do this with this technology, which I'm using as a tool to help my patient journey. And, and because this is a journey, we're talking about a journey yeah. of the doctors and of the patients as well right 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 yeah no it's very true um here's an interesting question for you um you know most of my learners kind of tell me that they love the experience but they can only handle it for so long mm -hmm. right 
especially if it's your first time using virtual reality, mm. it can be, there's always this, what I like to call the, the mind tax. It, you know, it, it is taxing on the <laughs> mind to, to have that much dopamine and serotonin flowing and seeing all these exciting, interesting mm. images and stuff like that. Mm. Um, how long do your average users tend to last in a session? Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a, an interesting question because it's something about practice. It's very practical. Uh, it comes up a lot lately to, um, to our webinars and to our everyday routine. People keep asking me, what is the time? There, are, there is a lot of research that has been done right now in VR. Um, I think most people, when they first, like people like me, I have very bad motion sickness. So people who suffer from motion sickness tend to have a bit of a more intense experience and maybe it's a little bit more difficult for them to stay in the VR for long without getting dizzy or nauseous. Um, so it's usually the first time that this happens. Like right now I can have the headset for a lot longer uh, than I, I could have it in the first time I tried. So I think with um, uh, our brain gets used to things very quickly. And it's, uh, it's all a matter of habit. Uh, there are some research papers that state that um, the ideal time would be around like half an hour, maybe. So half an hour sessions, do a little um, small group teaching, a little meeting, um, 20 minutes, 15. So you can start with 15 minutes or 20 and see how everybody's responding. Um, of course, it's always very helpful to have someone around to um, um, support uh, the students and um, maybe they feel safe if they know there is some uh, obstacles around because it's also a matter of orientation, how we orientate ourselves in space. Um, and then, of course, we can increase and see how everyone uh, is feeling. Yeah. Um, I don't know, did you notice any like... Uh, do you perform any specific time sessions in your meetings or in your group learning and teaching? Yeah, you know, initially when we started, we were kind of going for the 15 to 20 minute type sessions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I would say we're constantly pushing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Now our neuroaxial masterclass is close to like 45 minutes. Yes. And, and that seems like so long in virtual reality. Um, <laughs> Which, which is also a very interesting thing that a lot of our users tell us, which is um, 45 minutes without being able to like, you know, come out or look at your phone or like kind of do all these things. Mm. It's very, it's very taxing on the um, millennial mind, right? Yeah. Because think about it, normally, you know, like any session you do 45 minutes to an hour long, like, uh, you know, at least you've looked at your phone 10 times in that. You get distractions. Yeah, yeah, you have distractions, but, but there are no distractions in VR, you yeah. know. It's it's so immersive, and it's also it's a way it's a gamification of learning. Learning becomes so much easier because, apart from the lack of distraction, it's also very fun. Like people forget to get out of it. They're like, oh, yeah. where is the real room? Where is the real space? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you do lose a sense of time too. I have noticed that you know, like you blink an eye and 40 minutes is gone. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's interesting. It's two realities combined at the same time, which I think um, it's, it's going to be the future in, uh, in our education, learning, allowing all these endless possibilities to, to come. Um, let me see our chat. Again, we have another thank you. People are thanking you, Dr. Rohan. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so there's no more Q&A. We just reached one hour, uh, the one hour of our webinar. Um, so of course, uh, you can visit us and explore how 3D organ uh, virtual reality is rapidly transforming uh, the learning in healthcare, um, allowing both the educator and the learner and the patient to visualize anatomy in an entirely new perspective, as we just saw from this amazing um, presentation. Uh, we can provide you for any more information or any more uh, resources at a later stage. All you have to do is uh, drop us an email at prosupport at 3dorganon.com. While this webinar, of course, will be uh, available at our YouTube channel very soon. Um, 
I would like to thank so much, Dr. Rohan, for your inspiring work, um, for your presentation, and thank you all for your participation and input. Uh, from uh, sunny Boston, where we are right now, I'm wishing you to have a great and creative day ahead. Bye. Thank you so much for the opportunity and, and for all the work that you guys are doing in, in building this kind of technology. Um, thank you, Dr. Rohan. We appreciate your uh, input. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.